about Mabel's travel partner, Claire. Uh, <laughs> 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 well, I'm the backpacker, welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's great to be here. <laughs> Let's let, let's hear. Let's start right about Mabel the motorhome first, and then we'll then we'll learn about you. <laughs> okay, that's fair. She's the most important one at the moment. <laughs> um, yeah. So just with all the travel complications, let's say the, I decided this summer I was just going to stay in the UK, and I wanted to be self-contained. So I thought a great way to do that would be to buy a camper van. So I'm I'm sitting here now, actually, in Mabel the motorhome. You know, we're just raring to go and waiting for the lockdown to lift so we can go somewhere other than my parents' driveway. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about that process because I think a lot of people I've heard are thinking, I, I want to do some kind of travel this year and suddenly they're going to get a, a camper van, an RV, and it's, it's, it's another travel thing to learn. It's overwhelming to figure out the rental options, the purchase options, maintenance, license, uh, all this kind of thing. So talk about your process. Um, well, I'm very lucky, actually, when my cousin's uh, relative of mine, he deals in camper vans. So mm -hmm. I just basically called him up and said, Tom, find me a camper van. Um, so I'm really lucky that I had someone who knows what they're talking about. And, you know, he could check the um, like the maintenance of the van and all the, the history and things like that. Um, so that would, that, you know, if you're looking for a camper van, I highly recommend getting somebody who knows something about mechanics or cars or something so they can check that you're not going to end up with a total banger that's going to you know break down um and yeah i i really wanted to be self-contained um so i think well certainly in the uk you know a lot of the campsites they're not going to have shower mm -hmm. or toilet facilities open so um i'm lucky i've actually got a my own little bathroom and a shower and a toilet and everything so um yeah that's something to bear in mind if you do want to buy buy a camper van for this year, whether that will apply, um, you know, for coming years, but definitely for this year, you need to be, be self-contained. So in those, in terms of opening up, I understand July 4th, there'll be some opening up in the UK that, that will allow you to, to go out with Mabel and sleep elsewhere and with, with her, or, or I guess hotels are allowing uh, movement as, as well, but the, the, this, the rest of the summer, you don't expect the, the campsites, the facilities to, to open up? Yeah, um, well, in England, it's slightly different for each of the different countries, actually. But mm -hmm. yeah, England, 4th of July is when they can open. Um, okay. But because of the really strict uh, cleaning and social distancing, um, there's a lot of campsites that either don't have the, the staff or they're just mm -hmm. not able to, to, to open them safely. So I think a lot of taking the decision just to keep them closed. Um, okay. Yeah, which which I can understand. Um, you know, it it just makes it a little bit more complicated for for people traveling, unfortunately. But you know, it's just one of those things. I think at the moment. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it. Um, uh, speaking from a country where I feel like it's just been madness and and uh, anything yeah. anything goes. I mean, there can be rules, but then everybody seems to do whatever they want and enforcement of. I, I, I know from from your vantage point, it, it may not be feeling like the UK is doing as well, but I, it, it does seem a bit reassuring. <laughs> yeah, it, it could be worse. I think from the UK's point of view, it could be worse. You know, we we haven't done a great job, but yeah, when you look at the news and things like that, you think actually, yeah, we're doing okay. We're doing okay. The downside is obviously it depends on everyone else. Like if it was just up to me and my behaviour, I'm like I'm I'm okay. You know, we'll sort this out, but. Obviously, you can't control what everyone else does, unfortunately. Um, you know, and they put everyone else at risk, which is, you know, sucks. But like I said, you can't really do anything, unfortunately, to change it. All right. Well, let's let's focus on the fun stuff. So where, where are you planning on navigating Mabel? Um, the first trip, I'm going to go to the Cotswolds, um, which is actually quite close to here. It's only about an hour's drive from where I am at the moment, but I've never been. So I'm looking forward to um, exploring that because I think the Cotswolds is one of those places that so many visitors want to go to and I'm like, oh, I've not been. So it, yeah, it, as awful as this whole situation is, you know, it's actually making me really appreciate what's what's on my own doorstep, you know, and I'm, I'm looking forward to exploring the UK more actually. 
Now, this group has a lot of people that uh, go to the most uh, ex extreme in their mind or remote places, so we, we tend to overlook. So I, my idea of Cotswolds is uh, towns and villages, and I, I really don't know much much more than that. So uh, tell me, tell me. me neither, to be honest. <laughs> but yeah, that's why I got there's cute little towns and rolling hills and nice hikes and sort of, uh, what do you call it, chocolate box kind of picturesque villages. That's what I have in my mind anyway. Um, yeah, it's a little less extreme than some of my previous <laughs> truffles, but you know, why not while I'm here? Okay, and then further afield, uh, any any for further trips? Are you looking at at longer longer stays? Wales, Scotland, where where all are you thinking of? Yeah, well, um, yeah, I'm basically going to spend at least the whole summer um, in the UK. So yeah, I really want to go to Wales. Um, I spent a bit of time there when I was younger, but I'd like to to go back and see more in Scotland. Yeah, I was only I was there for about a week last year and it was mm -hmm. just incredible. So yeah, I really want to explore more of Scotland. And and you live know, Lake District and uh, the Yorkshire Dales and I feel like I need some nature, you know, green space and somewhere big and open so I'm not locked up anymore. That's what I have in mind. What is a dale? I think it's a hill. Okay. <laughs> I'm not actually I, I, sure. I, it, it occurred to me I've been to places that say they're dales, and I don't really, uh, I don't really know my my dale. No. My hill. <laughs> it's either a hill or like a moorland. I think I think it's kind of a hilly moorland. I'm not even. I'm not even sure. That's terrible, isn't it? I will check. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they're great right words. I like how um, Brits use the word escarpment for some reason. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, describing a destination. So the, that's great. So what, yeah. what were the places in Scotland that that uh, you, you said amazing? So what, what really jumped out to you that, that we may not um, have visited on our quick visits? Well, I mean, Edinburgh is incredible, but, you know, Edinburgh is like London. Most people will go straight to Edinburgh, I think, when they go to Scotland. Um, but I went to the Isle of Skye, which is stunning, um, and around Glencoe, uh, which is mm -hmm. where they filmed, you know, things like, well, some have some Harry Potter scenes, actually, they filmed there, and um, a couple of the James Bond scenes from Skyfall was filmed up there, and it's just incredible scenery, just the mountains and lakes, absolutely beautiful, and um, if you are a Harry Potter fan, then you really have to take the the train uh, across the Glenfinnan viaduct. That's in the films anyway. That's a the Hogwarts Express. Um, but you don't have to be a fan actually to enjoy it because it is it's beautiful. It's a really really nice train train journey. You go up along the coast and then through the the hills and across this curved viaduct. It's absolutely stunning. So yeah, Scotland's amazing. Go to Scotland, mm. everybody. Uh, some of those they they require ferries. Is that right? Ferries to get yeah yeah the Isle of Skye. Um, uh, we took a ferry there, and then actually I think we drove off. Um, mm. So the Isle of Skye is connected by by road, but I, the, most of the other islands, yeah, it's a, a ferry ferry journey. Hmm. Fantastic. And uh, um, would that be a, would that be a car ferry then, or how would how would that be handled? Yeah, I think so. Most of them. Um, I've only been to a couple of the islands, actually. Well, just just Sky. Um, so I'm not sure, to be honest. But I think most would be a car ferry. I think. Don't hold me to that, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Oh, well, we'll we'll find out, and we'll, and we'll follow your reports. Speak, speak to the Harry Potter tourism, as I see in your Instagram feed. You you mentioned the train ride, and it, uh, it seems like everywhere you can turn up in in the UK, there's a Harry Potter connection. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I think, you know, everyone just went nuts over it because it is, it is so English. Um, you know, there's, you can take a Harry Potter tour in London, Edinburgh, and York. Um, you know, and then there's some really cool places actually to explore and um, some really cute streets. And, you know, there's a lot of places that you think, you know, even if it didn't influence Harry Potter, you know, it's still nice to go and it looks kind of oldie worldy and, and magical. So. Yeah, there's a lot of places that people like that actually. In the UK rather, including Scotland.
fantastic. Yeah. I've seen the movies. I, I haven't gotten to the books. I, I haven't gotten pulled in in the same way. So uh, mm -hmm. maybe maybe I need to sit down and, and go through the books. But, uh, yeah. You can even get me to fly across the world for a Star Wars filming site, I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, there are some amazing sites like that as well. I was in, went to Guatemala and to Tikal, and that was used as one of the, the rebel bases, and that's, that's pretty amazing. You know, a bit, bit different from Harry Potter, but very cool. Well, you, you got us across the Latin America, and that's where a lot of your experience has been, and, and a big theme around uh, work exchanges. So talk to us about the places where you have had work exchanges. Um, so I did work exchanges in Peru, um, Belize, Guatemala and Mexico and mm. uh, Bolivia um, and yeah I love doing work exchanges it's just such a cool way of spending time spending more time in a place you know without having to to pay for the accommodation you just, you just work for a few hours a day and then you can either you know go sightseeing in the afternoon or work on your own stuff and you, know, you really start to feel like you're part of the, the community there which is which is really really nice mm-hmm yeah, and, and so what are the logistics? And I'll, I'll share the link of uh, your resources on work exchanges. Uh, maybe define work exchanges and then how someone starts to uh, to think about the, the research process. Okay, well, yeah, work exchange is basically you're offering your time and your skills in exchange for accommodation, um, sometimes for food and, you know, the benefits that are included. But it's it's not working as such because you're not getting paid for it usually there are some paid placements but usually it's just uh, an exchange a cultural exchange and you're giving your time mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. probably the easiest way to find work exchanges is using uh, websites um, there's some really uh, probably the, the most popular work exchange sites are Workaway um, that's the one that, that most people have heard of but World Packers is another one um, Helpex Woof, which is just for working on organic farms. So if you want to do farming, um, there's a site specifically for that. Um, and then there's other ones that are, that are free, like Hippo Help is one. Um, mm. But yeah, there's quite a few actually. I think if you just sort of Google work exchanges, you can find um, find some more resources there. And in terms of the opportunities that that you're going to see at these, is, I mean, how legit? Are they? Or do you need to do a lot of due diligence? Can you have some confidence that if they're listed, they're they're pretty solid? Or? Yeah. Um, World Packers, for example, they they say that they call. Uh, you know, they 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 vet all of the people that advertise placements on their site. You know, just to make sure mm -hmm. that they are legit. Um, and also, you know, you can leave reviews, kind of like you know Airbnb or couch surfing or whatever. You know, you leave a review for other travelers um mm -hmm. you know usually i don't tend to choose somewhere without any reviews just because i like to have a bit more peace of mind you know as a solo female mm -hmm. traveler you just kind of be a bit more careful i guess um that you mm -hmm. want to see and also as well they have the option that you can contact past travelers who've been there as well so maybe if they didn't want okay. to leave such a detailed review you can maybe send them a message and be like hey you know how is it would you recommend it would you not um, so yeah, you need to do some some research. Um, uh, also, also, actually, World Packers. Um, I know that they have a really good. Well, they say they have a really good support team. Um, so that if something does go wrong, they'll actually uh, help you find another placement, and they'll put you up in a hostel um, close to your placement for a couple of days while they try and find you something else. Um, so it's quite a nice sort of peace of mind. I've not had to <laughs> use that option myself but you know that's mm. that's what they say that they offer so uh, of the ones you mentioned the uh, like to talk about mexico because i think the the perception is uh concerns about safety and, and maybe in mexico city a big international city that there might not be the same tourist culture that that would support this so let's let's talk about mexico city uh, i love mexico city i could talk about mexico city all day so yeah, this works for me. Um, I, I loved Mexico City. It is huge. Obviously, you know, I think it's a, the biggest city in North America. Um, and there are parts, you know, that are not for tourists, let's say, but 
Mexico City has the highest number of museums in the world. Mm. Mexico City and Paris, I think, are tied or they keep switching for the top position. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you want to learn about culture, then Mexico City, definitely. There's amazing food there. Oh, my God. The street food is insanely good in Mexico City. And the people are right. Actually... street food is, is safe for you to eat and which ones to give a pass on? <laughs> Someone gave me a tip and they said, where the police eat, you got to eat that because no one wants to poison the police, right? So... <laughs> Um, and also, if it's if it's busy, you know, if you see a lot of local people eating there, then usually that's a good sign. One, because local people eat there, and two, because there's quite a high turnover of food, so you know it's not going to be sitting there for ages. But yeah, yeah definitely. Eat those, uh, those ice drinks are those are the ones I avoid. I feel like that's that's really tempting. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, yeah, this oh, the tacos, yeah, amazing, amazing. Mm. Oh, right. you're making the, uh, the, the, safety, the safety aspects of Mexico City? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, it is a big city. And there are things that you don't do. For example, as a, certainly as a solo female, I would not go walking around the streets at night on my own. Um, if I was going to go out at night on my own, I would take an Uber, you know, to where, to where I was going. Um, yeah, you do have to be careful. Like any major city, you know, I don't, like London, I wouldn't probably walk around on my own at night there either. Um, mm-hmm. the, on the, the underground, the, the metro system, there are female-only carriages, which I'd also recommend for solo female travelers mm-hmm. to take because um, it is does get super busy. So you also have the risk of pickpockets, but you know also more, more unpleasant things like groping for women. So yeah, take the female-only carriages. Mm-hmm. Um, and as much as I hate to say it, but, dress conservatively you know you're not on the beach you are in a city and everyone else is working and going to work so you know mm-hmm. i wish we could wear whatever we want but you know unfortunately you might draw a bit more attention than than you want like i said i hate saying that because it really shouldn't matter what you wear but mm-hmm. unfortunately yeah you need to be a bit more careful mm. and what were the uh was it one or multiple work exchanges you did there uh, Mexico City, I was working in one hostel um, for about four months because I just mm-hmm. fell in love with it. Um, mm-hmm. And then I was doing some other work in, in Merida, which is in the Yucatan area, um, close to Cancun. I was working there for another month. Um, but yeah, I'm no Mexico City, just, oh man, fell in love with it. And so many people overlook it as well. It's definitely an underrated destination, I would say. For those that, that haven't visited Mexico City, so they, they want safety, they, they want uh, to visit some of the sites, what, what are the neighborhoods that, that you would point them to to, to seek out? Um, I stayed in a neighborhood called Roma, uh, Roma Norte, uh, mm-hmm. and that's also close to Condesa. They're really nice areas. Um, you know, it's quite wide streets, it's leafy suburb style. Um, Oh, there's another area, I can't think of the name of it now, that's more where some of the higher end hotels and the embassies are. Mm. Uh, Polanco, I think it's Polanco. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. That's also um, quite a good area to, to stay, I believe. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, I really liked Roma and Condesa. It's loads of restaurants, loads of bars as well. And that area, I did feel more comfortable walking around um, in the evening. Um, but yeah, still better off in a in a new but generally speaking. And then uh, the the other countries in Latin America that you've you've done work exchanges have these typically been been hostels as well that you've you found the opportunities. Yeah, I worked mostly in hostels partly because there's a lot of there certainly were a lot of opportunities. I don't know how much that's going to change now with all this coronavirus stuff. I don't know whether hostels are still going to be as popular, but. You know, at the time, yeah, there was a lot of opportunities available. And I loved it because you meet so many different people. You know, you meet the local people that work there and, you know, in the community. And then you also get all these travelers coming through. Um, so it was really good fun. It was really good fun. I did do a work exchange with um, a tour company. And I was uh, helping them with their, uh, with their website, you know, writing blog content for them. Um, but yeah, no, most of the places I've worked at hostels, so that's just personal preference. You know, you can find all sorts of different opportunities on work exchanges, you know, like NGOs or eco projects or teaching in a school or all sorts of things. 
So yeah, check it out if you're interested. There's lots of different options. Okay. And what, what is the kind of work you, you're doing in these? In, in the hostel? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, most of them I'd be on reception. So you know, you do a few hour shift there. So you'd be welcoming guests, checking them in, you know, showing to their rooms. Um, usually some cleaning as well. Um, you know, we change the bed sheets, things like that. It mm -hmm. depends. You know, sometimes if a hostel's got a bar, you might do bar shifts or you know night shifts. Um, it just depends. There's usually you know different opportunities available. I, I usually preferred working on reception just because it was super easy. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, if it was quiet, then I could just sit there with my laptop and do my own thing. Um, but it's also where you get to meet other people coming in as well. So you know, that's sure. I, I usually prefer reception personally. And so typically, they're giving you accommodation and meals uh, in exchange. Or? Yeah, usually uh, accommodation is the minimum. Um, mm -hmm. Most hostels would include breakfast, and some would include you know your three meals a day as well. Mm -hmm. And it depends, like I saw a place in a surf school and they offered free surfing lessons, things like that, or free tours. Yeah, it, it depends on the placement, but yeah, usually there's other benefits, language exchanges, you know, language classes, things like that as well are popular. So yeah, lots mm. of good, good stuff in exchange. All right, and so you've, uh, you've got these multiple countries. Well, we don't know at all what the, what the regulations or what the opportunities will be. Uh, but for someone starting out, which which, which one was the easiest to, to take up as a first of, of the mix you've tried? Um, first country or first kind of job, do you mean? The, the work exchange, yeah. The work. Um, I mean, hostel probably is pretty easy. Um, mm -hmm. It does help if you speak a bit of the local language, but usually they just require, I mean, English most commonly, because, you know, that's obviously the most common language. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't need any specific skills or qualifications or anything. You just need to be kind of outgoing and um, and, and welcoming. Um, but it depends on your skills. You know, if you if you really want to learn um, about permaculture or farming, then you know working on a, a farm or an eco project is a really good option. Or if you'd rather do stuff with your hands, you know, you can get mm -hmm. painting work or handyman kind of work. Mm -hmm. It just depends what you're into, really. Hmm. Okay. And of the countries, uh, so we talked about Mexico City, the, the mix of other countries that, that you, you've done work exchange. Are there any that, that you'd say maybe maybe give a pass in, in terms of the work exchange experience? Or they're all, they all have your um, seal of investment? Um, Belize, I think actually, I'm not even sure you're supposed to do any volunteering in Belize without a proper visa. I didn't realize that at the time. Um, so I think looking back, maybe that wasn't wasn't ideal um but yeah I, I think most countries you can find work exchanges in most countries um but yeah just check it out and check check the different opportunities available you know most of the work exchange websites i mentioned that you know you can have a look on there for different opportunities before you sign up so you know just check out what's available for where you want to go but yeah basically anywhere um most countries anyway there's a few exceptions obviously but you know, most places they'll have something. So, in, in terms of the reg regulatory piece, you're you're not working, as you're not being paid. So, in in a general approach, you're you're looking for places that a, a tourist visa would give you the amount of time you need, and you're not applying for a, a work visa for a number of these countries. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely check for the country where you're going. Um, because it does vary and it obviously depends on where you are from as well. Um, I think for the UK, they're pretty strict that you do actually need a specific uh, working visa, whereas most other countries don't um, because, yeah, you're not actually working, um, you're sort of volunteering. But I, I would check. I would check that certainly for every every place that you want to go just to make sure, you know, you're not going to get deported or, you know, get sent away and stop from going back. Um, but yeah, generally, I mean, yeah, maybe just not mention it to the to the passport yeah. control guy that you know you're going to be able to vote. Yeah, not, not the one where you uh, <laughs> gave the whole life yeah. story. You just <laughs> yeah, actually, but just holiday, yeah, travel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope no one's watching from immigration. I'm sorry. 
Yeah, I mean, as, as you said, it's a very different thing. If you're going to work, you're going to take payment, and and uh, I mean, these these various platforms and sites you mentioned, do they give any research tools or indications on on the regulations for the destinations, or do they just say it's up to you to figure that out? I I mean, they do sort of cover their cover their backs and say it's your responsibility, but I know just from looking in the UK, I think. Um, I think they usually do put on that you need to have that either they'll put that automatically on or the host uh, will specifically say you know you need to have this kind of visa before you apply for the job because mm. um, you know, they want to wash their back as well I don't think you know they want to get in trouble for having illegal workers either mm -hmm. all right and uh, you've, you've spent uh, these experiences are all in Latin America what are your next targets assuming it's possible in, in the next year or two yeah, um, well, I was supposed to go to Morocco in March, which was unfortunately oh. cancelled, of course, like everything else. Um, so that's definitely very high up on the list. You know, I haven't been anywhere in Africa, so I really want to go well to Morocco and uh, everywhere, basically. Um, Australia, New Zealand, Asia, I haven't really travelled at all in Asia either, so that's high up on my list. Everywhere, basically. Um, yeah, I would also go back to Latin America as well because there's still a lot of countries there that I, I missed. I, I ran out of time. Mm. Um, yeah, but it's tough to choose, isn't it? Where you, you know, whether you want to go somewhere completely brand new or whether you want to kind of go and finish, finish that continent. I don't, you know, I don't know. But I've got time. I hope I've got time. What kind of debates uh, <laughs> that, that that are common in our group of uh, trying to go everywhere, but also see places in depth and returning to ones you like. It's uh, a, uh, a a good a good conflict in decision making to have, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are a lot worse problems to have. Let you know. Let's be honest. It's a pretty pretty lucky position to be in. But yeah, yeah, and uh, I, I I prefer traveling slowly. You know, I think so I spent like six months altogether in Mexico and three months in Guatemala and a couple of months in Colombia, for example. And yeah, I, I, I don't want to just go somewhere for a weekend or a week. I really want to get to know the place. So yeah, I, I, I could go back. Yeah, there's still so many places in Mexico that I didn't visit. So mm, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe Asia next, maybe. We'll see. Mm, okay. And you, you referred to your business and of course impacted at the current time. So so talk about your business and, and how you make that work with the with, with the travel and the and the, the work exchanges. Yeah. Well, um I I have my blog, you know, Tales of a Backpacker. I started that actually when I went traveling. Um the, the, I first started a blog actually when I lived in Barcelona and I suddenly had all this free time on my hands because I didn't own a TV. So I was like, mm. Oh, what can I do in the evening? So I started the blog. <laughs> and then when I went traveling, I was like <laughs> when I went traveling this is amazing you know how can I keep doing this so you know I was just trying to find some way to keep traveling so yeah so I started the blog um, and that's now actually grown into to a business and last year you know I was doing doing okay um, obviously you know 2020 happened and I think like anyone in the tourist industry actually um, it's just a big fat mess basically um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I'm, I'm really very, very lucky that I've been able to spend lockdown at my parents' house. So that's been a huge weight off. Like I haven't worried about, you know, paying rent or anything like that. So I'm so, so lucky, um, and happy for that. So I'm, I'm going to be okay. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I'm one of the lucky ones, um, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I can just wait it out and hope that, you know, when travel picks up, you know, I hope it's going to be a massive boom next year if not at the end of this year that's what I'm, you know i think we're all hoping for that to be honest if we can make it through these these um tough times hopefully you know it will get better that's what i'm hoping for mm, fantastic and you've uh build built a a following on both instagram and twitter and i, I notice a lot of people are, are one or the other these days if they're in travel blogging so tell me about how you use both platforms um, I, I prefer Twitter, to be honest, I find, you know, you can have better conversations and it feels like it's more of a community on Twitter. Mm. Instagram, I kind of do it cause I have to, which sounds awful. Um, 
and it depends. I go through phases with Instagram. Like I won't post anything for a few weeks and then I'll go decide that I really want to, you know, get my community on there and I post it for a few weeks and then nothing happens. Oh, oh, forget it. I'll go back to Twitter or even start on TikTok, which is what I ended up doing um, during lockdown. But I think that was just a, a brief phase. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I prefer Twitter usually. That's my, my go-to social media generally. So for those travel bloggers, we'll say, or content creators, that term that, that haven't been using Twitter, what are, what are they missing out? And and what? Yeah, I, I feel the reverse. I'm, I feel more comfortable on Twitter than Instagram, and probably because you said that you can't really have a conversation on Instagram. You can say, hey, look at me, and keep yeah. like, like, looking at me. <laughs> so all, all these big Instagrammers, what, what should they do with Twitter? Um, Just talk to people you know i twitter you can post literally anything on twitter anything you know it doesn't have to look pretty it doesn't have to be any style or you don't have to edit it for ages you literally just post you know oh i'm having a really crappy day and then you know other people go oh no what's the matter and hope you feel better and it just it's just a nicer community Although there is also horrible, horrible people on Twitter as well. Um, so if you get any horrible comments, don't take it to heart. Um, yeah, you get more trolls on Twitter, I think. But yeah, more more conversations generally that are nicer on Twitter. <laughs> generally <laughs> speaking. Yeah, I mean, it's good. And I get disappointed when I see people that just their Twitter is just auto post of their their blog recycling their blog posts or something and they aren't they aren't having a conversation yeah I, mean, I do do that as well i'll be honest um but i like to combine it with both you know with with twitter the feed moves so quickly you know i, I can't physically be on twitter all the time oh, okay. um but you know i do find it quite useful to have a mixture of both on there so yeah i will hold my hand up i do recycle my own posts on there um, oh, and I, yeah, I think I didn't mean to say that that's wrong, but if that's if that's the only thing on the feed, then it's then it's like yeah, not really the point. To, to, yeah, if you don't, if the the ones that never reply, I, I should say. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, I do. I'm on there a couple of times today checking, checking messages and stuff. So yeah, no, I, I do have conversations for sure. Yeah. <laughs> And um, you, you've written an, an Airbnb guide uh, how to use it for the first time, and, and this goes back some time. And I'm thinking about as, as travel goes forward. Uh, it sounds like I mean, you, you and Mabel will be together for a, a point of time, but uh, you, when you think about say 2021 hotels, Airbnb, how, how are you thinking about those different options? Um, I mean, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what happens and how everything develops in the next few months. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I like staying in Airbnbs. I usually prefer staying in, in private rooms in apartments just because I've seen the impact that Airbnb has on you know, Barcelona, for example. It was pushing mm -hmm. the rent up so much that the local people can't live there anymore. Mm -hmm. um, although having said that, you know, if I'm working, sometimes I just need... Uh, need a home away from home. You know, if I'm staying for a longer period, then I do prefer Airbnbs. Um, and hostels, like I love hostels. Usually a private room. Now I'm a little bit older. I like my um, privacy. But I really love the social aspect of hostels. Um, you know, and the, the events and you're hanging out and you do a pub quiz or whatever in the evening. So you can meet people, but then you can just sort of crawl back to your room and, and get some alone time. Um, so yeah, usually hostels are my preferred place to stay when I'm when I'm not in Mabel the motorhome. Yeah, so I, I hope that hostels make it through this this coronavirus time. I really do. Yeah, it's it, it is hard to predict, and I, I've never been one for the, the shared bedroom uh, experience. But uh, hostels have evolved, where they have very much hotel style accommodation as well. Oh gosh, yeah, yeah. Like I've done the dorm. Uh, a lot obviously when I was backpacking you know that's usually where I sleep but if you want a good night's sleep it has to be a private room uh, um, yeah, yeah I, th I think you know as you get a little bit older yeah uh, but budget wise you know if you're only paying what $20 or less even for a dorm room like if you're on a budget then you cannot beat hostels you know for safety and 
a combination of safety and cheapness. Um, yeah. But now, definitely, I'm, I'm a private room girl. Mm. Fantastic. And uh, when I was looking through your Instagram feed, uh, waterfalls of South America popped up. And there was one that uh, I had no idea of, the, the Devil's Cauldron in Ecuador. Oh, yeah. uh, talk about talk about that as a destination. I'll share the post in the comments. Oh, yeah. Um, Ecuador is incredible. Um, you know, it's, I think, don't quote me on this, but I think it's got one of the highest biodiverse, bio, mm. biodiversity of, of any country. Um, mm. And yeah, that waterfall, El Pilon. Oh, I haven't spoken Spanish for a while. My accent's probably terrible. But El mm. Pilon del Diablo, the, yeah, the Devil's Cauldron. Um, I had seen it myself on Instagram before I went to Ecuador. So it was one of those, it was already on my radar. Um, but yeah, there's so much to see there. So much to see, and you know, the as well as the Amazon, the Galapagos. Oh my gosh, that was one of the highlights of my trip to South America. Definitely, was going to the Galapagos Islands. Um, yeah, there's and nowhere how, else. How like did you visit Galapagos on a budget? Um, it is expensive. It was a huge chunk out of my budget. You know, it costs. Mm -hmm. Well, then this was what four years ago. It cost a hundred dollars just to actually get on the island and you have to pay the flight to actually get there and then there's the hundred dollar fee mm -hmm. um but I, I didn't do a cruise most people take a cruise i think but i actually sort of hopped uh island hopped instead so i was mm -hmm. staying in you know accommodation either hostels or sort of cheaper hotel rooms um and taking day trips which i which for me worked out cheaper but also also, I get motion sickness. I get really bad seasickness. So the thought of sleeping on a boat was just <laughs> did not appeal to me at all. Um, so that was the best option. And actually, I, I did some volunteering there for two weeks. And um, on it wasn't Isabella Santa. Oh gosh, it was a few years ago now. I've forgotten the name of the island. Um, but I was volunteering for two weeks on one of the islands. So then I got mm -hmm. to do day trips around there, and then I spent another week island hopping. Um, and that was that was really good actually really good i'd recommend doing that actually oh, fantastic it's good to hear the approach I, I had just a short visit and i just for a few days i just whatever boat was leaving that would sell me a cheap seat i, I would hop mm -hmm. on but then the downside was it was just so much time back and forth each day that that it uh, wasn't something i necessarily recommend to other people to replicate yeah it's harsh because your time there is so precious and if yeah if you end up wasting some of it it's um it's a real shame um yeah i think i i imagined that i could do it in a week and then i thought well hang on you know what if i spend two weeks on one island then i can really properly sort of get get my teeth into it and yeah it's a very special place very special place and tell me about this pink lake in mexico <laughs> yeah la, las coloradas um, yeah, again, Instagram's full. I'd seen this photo on Instagram of these pink lakes and there was this girl in the pink lake with her pink, uh, flamingo, um, lilo thing. And, you know, as you do with Instagram, you're like, oh my God, it looks amazing. And it does look very pretty, but mm. it's, um, they're artificial lakes. They're, it's for, for salt manufacture. Um, yeah. And they, you can't actually go in the water anymore. They've stopped that because it contaminates it. And because the salt content is really, really high, it will sting, um, you know, if you've got any cuts on it or anything. And I think, yeah, they have changed it quite a lot in the last couple of years. They've become more strict. And I think now you have to pay a tour guide to actually take you around. Oh. Um, so yeah, don't believe everything you see on Instagram. Um, <laughs> I've never um, used Instagram for travel planning in any sense. Any, yeah. it sounds like you do use it. Yeah, I do. Well, certainly, I did for that trip. Yeah, because um, you know, I, I I like to get a combination of things. Really, you know, mm -hmm. partly for my work. Yeah, it it just look good to get all these nice, pretty pictures. So I have that side of it. But mm -hmm. yeah, I also really like to get to the cultural side and the food. I'm a big foodie, so. Anywhere with good food um, it sort of attracts me. Um, and then I usually look at where to go once I've chosen the place with the best food. That's usually, you know, my stomach leads the way generally. 
Yeah, I wasn't thinking of it that way. I, I, it doesn't appeal to me to use Instagram to plan destinations, but food, I could, uh, I'm sure I could learn a lot, even if I don't go to those specific spots that, uh, mm -hmm. and that, that, uh, I'm sure that there, there's no end of food posts for just about any destination. So I could, uh, yeah. I could, I, I could maybe, may, maybe grab it that way. And, and, and one last thing on your Instagram, I mean, it's, it's not a lot of, Hey, look at me. It's, it's beautiful artwork. It's architecture, scenery. So I've, I, I find it very refreshing to talk, talk about that because you're, you're definitely going against the grain of, of what it seems like Instagram is used for. Yeah, I, you know, I've never really been a, you know, hey, look at me kind of person. And, you know, that obviously works for a lot of people because obviously you see a lot of photos like that. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, you know, your thing. That's fine. Um, but for me, yeah, I want to see the destination. I don't want to see a person there you know i want to know what the actual place is like not what mm -hmm. it looks like on holiday so yeah that that's having said that i also i do want to post a bit more of me because i feel like when someone looks at my my feed they don't know who i am okay. so i do yeah. want to bring in a few more photos to be like yeah this is actually me like i was here <laughs> um, but yeah not necessarily me 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 just a bit of me and then here's a nice you know, nice destination that I want to encourage you to go to. And how often do you post it? it uh, I keep asking Instagram because it's such a mystery to me, but it seems like the bigger the account, the less often <laughs> I post. So I, I just don't understand the, the whole concept. Yeah. No, I, I go through phases of it, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. At one point I was posting every day, but it was just exhausting. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've been trying every other day and then I forget and then, I don't post for a couple of days. Um, yeah, I've been told that every other day is supposed to be ideal or posting every day and doing like 10 Instagram stories, which is just insane. So no. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> no. That's that medicine I will not take. So. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. no. I, I think the, the issue now, if you want to grow on any platform is you've really got to dedicate the time to it. And mm. you, know, you need to decide whether it's, whether it's worth all the effort. If you just want to post for your own pleasure, then obviously, you know, do do whatever, but trying mm. to grow on there is really, really, really tough mm. for me anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not the best person to advise my Instagram. No, to I, I feel like there's a connection. Is you're, you're, you're clearly have a more practical mindset, which is more along <laughs> my lines too, to, to be practical and, and see it as a tool and, and uh, what I see a lot out there just it strikes me as frivolous. As I said, I've never used it as a trip planning tool, but that's uh, yeah, it's always important to take on new things and new learning, or at least to, in a business sense, yeah. to, to see what other people are interested in. And that and it's, yeah. it's, it's certainly shaping the way so many people travel. Is, uh, yeah. It is, yeah, for, for better or worse. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people do use it, you know, and then unfortunately everyone goes to that one place for the gram and then they just get the photo and then they leave mm -hmm. um so yeah i wouldn't recommend doing that but you know use it for inspiration by all means and then it does, it does sound like junkies you say it that way it's like junkies getting their hit <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i need the photo yeah it's, it gets a little crazy instagram for sure well yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll close with uh you, you shared a post on traveling when you're not traveling so virtual tours and that have you uh i think people are probably exhausted with that too. Is there one that that uh, you feel like would it was, was captivating and, and recommend to the audience? Um, I mean, cooking classes, you know, food wise, mm -hmm. you know, if you can't actually go to Italy and eat all this amazing pasta, maybe you mm -hmm. can learn to cook it yourself at home. Um, but I, yeah, as you said, I think everyone's getting a bit tired of, you know, Zoom calls and everything all the time. <laughs> Um, you know, there's nothing like actually getting there and doing it yourself. So maybe planning a trip, even if you don't book it yet, you know, try and get something in your mind of where you want to go. And then that will hopefully mm -hmm. see you through the next few weeks or months. And, you know, just keep thinking about that amazing trip that you will be able to take when all this is over. Well, in terms of, uh, also as a, uh, trips that I want to take. I, mean, I wouldn't have started 
uh, before we talked that I was learning about your travels. I wouldn't have said standing in a in a room of giant wheels of cheese would be <laughs> my my big trip, but you've got me captivated. So tell me about Bologna. It. <laughs> Bologna is the place to go. Oh my gosh, yeah, I loved it. Oh yeah, Italy's Italy's probably my favorite country in Europe, actually. Mm, yeah, I'm all about the food. What's your I don't know, 10th favorite country in Europe. That's too hard. But what, what, what are some of the runner-ups? Italy is a, a natural one. Are there any surprising in your top five or 10 that uh, get overlooked? Um, I, there's still a lot of places that I haven't been in Europe. So, you know, I haven't been anywhere in the, the Balkans. Um, I went to Latvia for the first time last year, which was lovely. Mm -hmm. um, I was hoping to go to Estonia then, but I ran out of time. Um, mm -hmm. I love Spain. Like, I lived in Barcelona for for four years, so that's always going to have a special place um, in my heart, definitely. Um, I would love to go to Croatia and um, Montenegro. Uh, to, yeah, I, my plan, well, it, it all depends on the situation, but, you know, UK over the summer, hopefully Europe, um, you know, maybe over the winter next year. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know. There's a lot of places that I haven't been to yet, so I can't really give my favorites without yeah. doing all the proper research. All right, well, fantastic. I, I shared several of those Instagram posts, so, so check it out. I, I, I certainly, uh, okay, you, the, the pink lake, maybe not if it's if it's artificial, but those <laughs> the wheels yeah. are cheese <laughs> and spinning and dancing around them. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely the cheese. <laughs> Unless you're lactose intolerant, in which case that'd be terrible. But yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today, Claire.